Hello, my name is Abby Harvey. I am the Deputy Communications Director with Blue Green Alliance. Thank you for joining our webinar. Uh, as we get started, I'd like to just cover a couple of quick housekeeping items. There will be an, an opportunity for questions and answers at the end of the event. Uh, to ask a question, you can use the Q&A uh, section on the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will be compiling questions throughout the event, so there's no need to hold them until the end. Uh, we'll be keeping track. Uh, additionally, we will be releasing some new data during this event. Uh, uh, act, we, more information on that data and a link to access the data will be sent out in a press release that we will release shortly after the event. Additionally, we are recording this event and we will have a downloadable uh, video for the press available. That again will be included in that uh, press release that we will be sending out. Now I'd like to hand it over to the Blue Green Alliance's Executive Director, Jason Walsh. Thanks, Abby. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Jason Walsh. I'm the executive director of the Blue Green Alliance, a national coalition of labor unions and environmental organizations. It's our partnerships guiding principle that Americans shouldn't have to choose between good jobs and a clean environment. We can and must have both. We now have an historic opportunity to see that principle realized in federal legislation. The Build Back Better Act has been labeled as a human infrastructure bill as a social policy bill, as a safety net bill, but we are here to talk about it first and foremost as a jobs bill that will create and support good union jobs, clean up our air and water, build a more equitable economy for all Americans and put us on a path to meeting our climate goals. To demonstrate the jobs impacts of Build Back Better, the Blue Green Alliance is releasing today an analysis of several of the major investments of this legislation using an input output economic model. We will not use this call to drown you in numbers, don't worry, but I wanna provide one example from this analysis. The United States has lost 270,000 manufacturing jobs since February, 2020. Based on our analysis, the manufacturing and industrial investments included in the Build Back Better Act would support 1.27 million total jobs over 10 years and also create or sustain hundreds of thousands of additional long-term jobs at factories built, expanded or retooled with federal support and leverage private sector spending throughout the economy. It does this by making strategic investments to build up our domestic supply chains so that manufacturing workers can make the clean technologies of the future here in America by rewarding the use of American-made iron and steel and manufactured goods for clean energy projects, and by making targeted investments to transform our basic industries like steel, cement, and aluminum to be the cleanest and most competitive in the world. Bottom line, Build Back Better will ensure that America's manufacturing workers and communities across the nation are finally a full part of the clean energy economy we're building. BGA has also analyzed other investments in the bill, including in lead service line replacement, transit, building energy efficiency, transmission, and community and worker resilience. You can find that at our website for which a link is provided in the chat and we'll be sending it out afterwards. We also wanna underline on this call that Build Back Better will ensure that this public investment creates better jobs particularly in clean technology sectors and better jobs in more communities and for more workers. The legislation attaches labor standards to clean energy and EV tax credits for the very first time, ensuring the investments we make in these sectors result in good paying union jobs for workers across our country. And it makes targeted additional investments in the communities and workers who need it most, driving job creation to communities that have seen a loss of jobs and economic opportunity, including and notably to coal and deindustrialized communities. Before I pass the, the mic to my coalition partners, let me, uh, let me provide a quote from someone who was an inspiration and pivotal figure in the history of the Blue Green Alliance. The late US Senator Paul Wellstone of Minnesota once said, we all do better when we all do better. We are here to urge the U.S. House of Representatives to pass the Build Back Better Act in the coming days and Congress to get this over the finish line in the coming weeks to start delivering these jobs benefits to workers and communities so we can all do better. Let me now uh, uh, turn it over to my friend and colleague Roxanne Brown, 
International Vice President of the United Steelworkers Union. Roxy. Thanks so much, Jason. And it's, it's so great to be here to talk about this uh, important bill, the Build Back Better Act. Um, and I want to start on a little bit of uh, a, a sad note, but it's, but it's with good purpose. My father-in-law uh, unfortunately passed away from COVID last year. Um, but one of his favorite sayings was, finish the job. And that's what we're here asking Congress to do. Finish the job by passing the Build Back Better Act. You know, our union, along with the entire labor movement, is excited that President Biden signed the $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill into law on Monday. And we were proud to do the work to help get that bill over the finish line. We, we launched a campaign almost nine months ago called We Supply America to highlight all of the ways United Steelworkers members supply America's infrastructure systems from components like iron, steel, cement, fiber optic cables, road lighting, and so many others to the services USW members perform like road construction, pipeline maintenance and repair, water system maintenance and repair. The main goal of our We Supply America campaign has been to help pass both the physical and social Build Back Better infrastructure bills. Together, they represent a historic $3 trillion investment in the American worker and the American family. With long overdue and needed supports like childcare and expanding Medicare to incorporate hearing benefits, which for workers and heavy manufacturing, that's a big deal. In 2019, manufacturing workers were about 75% of hearing loss cases. So this bill is important. And together, both of these bills put us on a path of economic sustainability for workers, industry, families, and communities. Importantly for USW members, they provide investments in the long-term viability and innovation of the domestic manufacturing sector. We're particularly pleased that it includes domestic content requirements on clean energy tax credits to create demand, a revival of the 48C tax credit to help manufacturers invest in their facilities for the long term, and $4 billion to the Department of Energy for grants and loans to help manufacturing facilities deploy state-of-the-art technology. Lastly, a big piece of both of these bills is really about securing the US's position as a global clean energy leader. By the end of the decade, the global market for clean energy technologies will be at least, at least $23 trillion. We need to make these technologies and the components and the supporting supply chain here in the US and not cede them to other nations as we've done for decades. That has been the American story. Innovate the technology here, then cede it to the rest of the world to deploy it and manufacture it. The time for the US to write and correct that American story and to become the global leader in these technologies and in the stuff that goes into these technologies that USW members make is now. We need to pass the Build Back Better Act, and USW members are ready to help us get that done. Thank you. Thank you, Roxy. Uh, let me now introduce Michael Brune, the Executive Director of the Sierra Club and the BGA's Board Co-Chair. Mike. Thanks, Jason. Hi, everybody. Uh, I am Michael Brune, Executive Director for the Sierra Club, and I'm really pleased to be on this call with some of my friends and colleagues in the environmental and uh, labor movements. Really, uh, I think that the Blue-Green Alliance was created for moments like these because it brings our movements together and because collectively, individually, we see fighting climate change not just as an obligation, but as an opportunity, an opportunity to promote environmental, economic, and racial justice all at the same time. And because of our collective efforts and the work of tens of millions of people and because of the leadership of President Biden and his administration and leaders in Congress, 
The Build Back Better Act will accomplish all of these things. The Build Back Better Act includes more than 130 programs that would invest close to $600 billion in climate action and environmental justice. This is obviously an historic level of investment that our communities desperately need to build a healthier and more equitable society. Investments that would put us on the path to achieving President Biden's goal of cutting climate pollution in half by 2030 while advancing racial, economic, and environmental justice. These investments will And these aren't just these are jobs that are good, family sustaining, better to the middle class. In the Build Back Better Act, that as Jason mentioned, will invest uh, in the replacement of low service lines. This will create not just promote access to. It looks like we're having some video uh, connection problems with you, Mike. Uh, but I, I think I think we got the main substance of it. Um, uh, so let let's turn this over. Let me suggest for the Q and A, Mike, that you turn off your video and just stay on audio, if that makes sense to you. Um, okay. Let let me thank you, Mike. Uh, let let me uh, let me now introduce James Williams Jr., General President of the International Union of Painters and Allied Trades, Jimmy. Thank you, Jason. And as the previous folks spoke about, as a representative of a construction union that represents thousands, um, I, I want to first start by commending um, those that, that passed the first piece of what's going to make our country move forward um, in a better economy for the working class, which was the Infrastructure Act that was, that was signed into law this week, um, and, and commend the few brave Republicans that stepped outside of the norm uh, to pass this bill, but it's not enough. Um, going into it, it never was enough. Um, you know, we in the construction industry are gonna benefit from having jobs, but they gotta be good paying jobs. And the Build Back Better Act takes us to another level. It's the first piece of legislation in, in it, that could be generational change for how we treat the working class in this country. As someone who focuses on the needs and struggles of all workers, our neighbors and our communities, I know the impact of good jobs and better wages on our local economies. And for generations, our federal government has not made the proper investments and the Build Back Better Act gives us this moment. It's about meeting the moment and the challenge of our future. As the youngest member of the AFL-CIO's executive council, I want my children to grow up in a clean environment, in a clean world, where we treat people with dignity, where we treat people with respect, and where we can live and grow as a, as a country. And the Build Back Better Act finishes the job. It was a mandate when President Biden was elected with majorities in the Democratic uh, caucuses in both the House and the Senate, and it's time to move forward. Americans need carbon-free, healthy homes and buildings it's not good enough to just have a job. We have to live in a clean society. The Build Back Better Act includes $500 million for energy efficiency, resil resiliency, and renewable energy upgrades for public buildings, as well as nonprofit buildings. That would create over 33,000 jobs in 10 years. And using a mid-range estimate of $146 billion, the Build Back Better Act will upgrade about 45% of the nation's public housing units with 1.8 million people living in public housing nationwide, that investment alone 
would benefit more than 800,000 public housing residents. We're, we are ready in the labor movement to step up and meet this moment. We must invest in transit in order to reconnect our communities. The Build Back Better Act includes $10 billion in additional funding for passenger rail and $9.7 billion in funding towards further transit-related efforts to connect our communities to jobs, schools, and other destinations. That alone would create 265,000 good-paying jobs, union jobs. The last thing I'll say about the Build Back Better Act, and it's so necessary, is that it's not just a job creation bill, it's a generational change. By passing the current form, we urge Congress to move, you know, the components of family sustaining jobs with a federal government that supports workers by passing pieces like the PRO Act, which is included in the Build Back Better Act. You know, we have a chance to make generational change and we implore on Congress to do so. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Jimmy. And uh, finally, let me turn to Colin O'Mara president and CEO of the National Wildlife Federation. Colin. Thanks, Jason. And it's, it's great to be with, uh, with with you, Jason, and with Roxy and Mike and Jimmy. Um, appreciate everyone being here and appreciate everyone being on, online as well. Uh, we're at the moment, right? We're at, the, at, the, at the, one of these inflection points in the next couple of days where we're going to be able to seize so many of the opportunities that have been talked about for months to create good paying jobs, to, to save people money, to you know, have cleaner air, cleaner water, out their natural resources and act on climate at a, at a scale, frankly, the world has never seen. And so it will be, this will be the largest investment. Let me just put a very fine point on this. This will be the largest investment um, in climate action, in natural resource restoration, community resilience and revitalization, clean air and clean water, and good jobs since the New Deal. Um, it's, it's, it's a huge, huge deal. Um, Mike already talked a little bit about some of the climate investments. There's also hundred more than $100 billion in the Build Back Better Act for restoration, resilience, and 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 making sure our natural resources are a huge part of the climate solution, our forests, our agricultural lands, our Bureau of Land Management lands, our, our coasts. Um, these are historic investments that have broad support, um, well beyond even the, the, the caucus across party lines. Um, so we're really on the cusp of transformational change. Um, we're also thrilled about the investments in renewable energy and energy efficiency and carbon capture and energy storage and transmission. Um, these are gonna drive opportunities and growth, as, as Jimmy just said, um, that are, are going to be transformative across the landscape. You know, and to pick up on a point that Roxy made, you know, the, I think one of the most important parts of this bill is that we're actually going to make, you know, make this future in America. You know, I, I'll kind of be damned if we're, we're going to spend the next like 30 years buying solar panels from China, buying offshore wind turbines from Germany, buying electric vehicles from Japan. I mean, all of those things can be made here. We have workers that can do it. We have the innovation that started here. Um, and this puts us on a path to actually have a clean energy future that is truly made in America. Um, just a few other quick ones. Um, we're also excited about the investments in transmission and the smarter grid. You know, billions of dollars of investment to leverage additional private money. Um, you know, more than 50,000 jobs, making sure our, our electrical grid is truly resilient and smarter and, and more connected to clean energy. Um, I, of course, I, I can't go at any any remarks like this. Not talking about the Civilian Climate Corps. You know, one of my my personal <laughs> one of my personal priorities. Um, 30 billion dollars for the Civilian Climate Corps is going to help uh, career training. It's going to help development. It's going to help immediately put people back to worth, young folks, folks of color, folks that have been left behind by this recovery, um, building healthier, more resilient communities. Um, more than 600,000 participants are kind of projected by our analysis over the, over the next 10 years. Um, so this is a huge deal. You know, this, this is a big freaking deal. And the, the investments in resilience, reclamation, restoration, and common sense conservation truly are historic. They don't get as much attention as the electric vehicles and the technologies and some of the other, the other pieces but there's never been a conservation package and restoration package of the scale that we're talking about. And using nature as an ally, using making sure we're gonna create good jobs, having folks make communities more resilient, but using nature as part of the solution, both to, rest both to reduce the amount of carbon uh, in, the, in the atmosphere, as well as making our communities more resilient. It's a huge deal. Um, and we're just grateful for the great partnership across the Blue Green Alliance to show how these pieces fit together. We can have both healthy manufacturing and great restoration priorities at the same time. We can do it in a way that strengthens the American economy. And so um, I'm proud to stand with our brothers and sisters in labor, proud to stand with our other environmental groups, but on um, the words of Larry the Cable Guy, it's time to get her done. Thank you, Colin. Um, uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm glad you got Larry the Cable Guy in there. Um, so uh, let's open this up for question. As, as Abby mentioned, uh, you go into the Q&A function. I see 
we have passed along here a question. Uh, Republicans in Congress have said the Build Back Better Act will cause uh, inflation to rise. How worried are you about the impact of this legislation uh, on inflation? Um, I can take a first crack at that. Um, look, major ratings agencies, including Moody's, uh, say it won't increase inflation. 17 Nobel Prize winning economists say it won't increase inflation. Even a curmudgeon like Larry Summers uh, says it won't uh, increase inflation. Uh, what it will increase indisputably is job quality, job access, labor force participation, and the chances that our kids will inherit a livable planet. This is a long-term investment in a more equitable, sustainable kind of economic growth for our country. If any member of Congress opposes this legislation due to misplaced fears about inflationary impact, they are misreading the economics and they're abdicating their responsibility. Um, anyone else wanna tackle that one? I would just, you know, echo what you said, Jason, about, you know, what, what the focus is in terms of job creation, job retention and creating the type of economy that we want for this country. You know, I, I think I worry more about what happens if we don't complete the pie with this bill for, for steelworker members. You know, before the pandemic, our members in industries like steel and aluminum were going through a hard time. The pandemic made that work worse for, for some of those sectors. We're looking at a period of recovery and getting our members in these sectors and others out of this kind of hole that they've been in so that their sectors are stronger, so that their jobs are in the communities for a longer period of time. On top of that, I think most of us on this call who are speakers have young children. I wanna make sure that what we're doing here creates an environment and an economy that my four-year-old will be able to thrive in, not just survive in, but thrive in when she's my age, when she's a 40 year old, okay? That's what we're doing here. And that's what I worry about, not how this bill will, will lend to inflation. Thank you, Rox. Uh, let's go to Colin and then Jimmy. Yeah, I think the only thing I'd add is just, I, I get in my kind of geeky economist hat on. Um, I don't get to use it often enough. Um, it's a bill that's paid for. And so, I mean, the combination of having it, you know, having revenues that are paid for, not you know, kind of creating additional pressures on the money supply and, and kind of on borrowing, um, it reduces almost any kind of inflationary pressure and it's spread over five to 10 years, depending on the program. And so it's not, we're going to see like an additional surge immediately. We're going to have sustained growth in many of these areas. And so um, the impacts on short-term inflation are, are, are non-existent. I mean, if anything, it'd be deflationary for that reason. And when you combine it with the investments in the supply chain, in manufacturing, you know, our ports and across, across the two packages, um, we actually address some of the biggest bottlenecks we have right now that are driving up prices in the near term. So I mean, this will be another investment that will help drive down prices long term. And that's before you get to the cost savings, like making energy efficiency more cost effective, making clean energy more cost effective, making you know, our buildings our buildings cleaner. So folks are using less money for operating expenses. Your schools can spend more money in the classroom instead of spending money on utilities. Um, this is going to have huge long term savings across the economy, having you know, more than offsetting um, any concerns that folks you know, have in, near, in, in the near term. Thank you, Colin. Jimmy. Yeah, I would just, I would just, I'm not an economist, I'm a construction worker. I would say anybody who wants to talk about inflation in this bill um, should take a look at what it's actually going to inflate. It's going to inflate the middle class. It's going to inflate wages for the working class once and for all, because it has wage standards and protections. Um, and, you know, as a commentary, you know, nobody cared about inflation every time tax cuts were passed when Republicans seized majorities. Um, like the Democratic Party has right now. And this bill, coupled with the infrastructure spending, coupled with all the work that was done in response to the pandemic, is about inflating the middle class and giving people a real shot at the working class that we want to see for this future. Well said. Uh, we are almost at time, but do, do we have any final questions from reporters? Put them into the Q&A, please. <laughs> 